Today on the Mr. Maple Podcast, Matt and Tim count down the top 50 Japanese maples sold in 2023, numbers 25 through 1. Konnichiwa, y'all, and welcome to the Mr. Maple Show, or maybe today we should call it the Mr. Ginkgo Show. Yeah, for years we operated MrGinkgo.com. Hey, y'all, I'm Tim. It's my brother, Matt. We run MrMaple.com. We do over a thousand varieties of Japanese maples, but we also do over 150 different varieties of ginkgo trees. And behind maples, ginkgos are one of our top selling items that we sell on MrMaple.com. So today we're going to break down our top 25 ginkgos that sold in 2023. You guys loved our list of the top maples for the year. It's one of our top videos in 2022. So we thought we'd expand that just a little and talk about another genre here on the podcast. And we're going to give you that insider information again. We're going to break down the top 25 ginkgos that sold on MrMaple.com. Now, if you go to MrGinko.com, still it takes you right to Mr. Maple. So they're one and the same. We still got MrGinko.com. But we, we've always offered a ton of different interesting ginkgos. We love ginkgo trees. We think they're such a, a great accompaniment to maples. You know, the fall color is outstanding. And they really just add so much to the landscape and garden. And so these are our top 25 sellers. So some of these we probably would have had on the maple list. Some of these some of these beat out our top 50 maples if we, if we combine the list. And again, this is our top 25 of what sold. So, you know, if we had had some of these in higher quantities, some of these may have been a little bit higher on the list, but you just start to see where our priorities are with our ginkgos and what our customers choose as well. So we hope you like this uh, look behind the curtain where we kind of show you uh, our sales here at Mr. Maple, things that were the most popular. Now, these are the people's choice. So y'all chose these. And uh, again, some of them we may have had 200 of, some of them we had 1,000 of. Uh, obviously, if we had 200 or something, it didn't have the potential to sell as much as the thing we had a 1,000 of. But these are pretty big numbers. We actually sold a ton of ginkgo this year. Um, so it's a pretty good representative of what the people choose to be the most popular ginkgos. Now, ginkgos are noted for having an amazing fall color. And that's true with almost all these ginkgos are going to have a bright school bus yellow fall color. But there's so many different characteristics. Ginkgos, they're from the fossil age. And we find fossils of them all around the world. Uh, they were na- actually native to uh, North America as well. So we always joke and say, bring back the native ginkgos. Uh, so, you know, people talk about native plants. Ginkgos uh, are a fantastic native to be planting right, around right. your garden, basically wherever you are in the, in the world, because they're so hardy and resilient. They're easy for people to grow. And that bright school bus yellow fall color make them an excellent companion plant for Japanese maples. And they look like something a dinosaur might have walked by. So it's got that cool factor. My little guy loves dinosaurs. My bo- Both my girls and my son love dinosaurs. So it's something that kids just kind of are drawn to. If you tell them something, this is something around when dinosaurs were alive, it even has a more, you know, just special quality to it. Now, today, we're primarily going to be talking about grafted male selections. Now, male ginkgos, they don't actually throw the fruit that females do. Um, male ginkgos... They, they just give you that fall color without producing that fruit. That fruit can actually stink on the female selections. So if it sits <laughs> around on the ground just like an apple or something like that, it can rot and stink in your yard. See, I, that's exactly the point I always bring up to people. They're like, well, ginkgos smell bad. I'm like, so do apple trees, but you value those. Like if you collected the ginkgo seeds, they wouldn't stink. So uh, I, all these are male selections. Now, full disclosure, we haven't offered a lot of female ginkgos this year. I've had some years where he and Ari... And some of the different female clones were highly sought after. I don't think we have a single female on this list this year for ginkgos. So all these are going to be non-seeding forms we're going to be talking about. But I've, I've had some years where uh, female ginkgos were at the top of the list for sales. Because they're rare and because you don't see them offered a lot, when we do offer them, they tend to sell out pretty quickly. So like some of the ones that are known for seeding young, like he and Ari, they, they tend to move pretty quick. Now, ginkgos are a lot like, you know... People say it like Japanese maples were years ago. People don't realize to the extent of the selection and diversity that you can get from a grafted clone. And so what we're talking about here in a second are the top 25 sales items of those grafted clones. You know, you may be familiar with ginkgos out in the landscape, 
but are you familiar with all these grafted clones? Because there's some really awesome ones you can use in your garden. Now, all these are going to be pretty much the same on zone tolerance. We always get asked that. Ginkgos are going to work zones three through nine. They are immaculate plants for so many reasons. They're salt tolerant. They're pollution tolerant. Um, you know, they, they, they can take salt spray. They can handle so many different qualities and still be durable. Uh, they're one of the most durable plants you'll ever see for cold and for heat. I've literally now, you know, we said three through nine. I've seen them push more than that. I've, I've seen pictures of ginkgos in Miami, even though I wouldn't recommend it for there. And I've seen ginkgos in Minnesota. So you think about how much of the United States, you know, that covers temperature wise. They can handle a, a, a wide range of environments from, you know, coastal to zone three cold. So it's kind of incredible what they can do. Now, ginkgos, they love lime. Give them some garden lime. That allows them to get established. They like that more alkaline soil when they're getting established. So if you can give, do that, give them some garden lime, that allows them to take up more water and more fertilizer and nutrients in the landscape. So just a, a quick tip before we get into these top 25. Yeah, and uh, you know, you've know you probably heard me make this terrible joke here before, but I, I had a lady call in one time, and she said, I've squeezed the lime all over the leaves. Do I need to bury the rind? And I said, at this point, you might as well just go ahead and make it a margarita. Like, that's not what you do at all. What you want is pelletized garden lime. You can buy it at most garden centers. It's like 2 $3 a bag. It's really cheap stuff. And we put two to three tablespoons around a one gallon or a three gallon. So if you're starting out with a younger ginkgo, you know, you can just top dress it with two to three tablespoons. Uh, we've done this three times a year. I don't think you can overdo it. We did, we did it once in spring, summer, and fall with a top dress of, you know, a couple tablespoons around it. You want to let it disperse, but that's going to make the soil more alkaline. Our friends in Japan told us this, and when we tested this theory, we had an entire greenhouse of ginkgos in one gallons. And Tim and I were like, how do we know how much to do? So we limed one side completely. And then we didn't lime the other side as a control. Well, you know, even by June, July, the trees that were on the lime side were significantly larger in one gallon, six to eight inches taller than their counterparts of the same cultivars on the left-hand side. So we knew for a fact the limes work and the lime helps them take up that energy more efficiently. And it's certainly making them a lot faster growing. So sometimes people say, I think ginkgos are really slow growing. Sometimes people say, I think ginkgos are really fast growing. And the difference may be the lime, and that, that really could be the dividing factor there and why people think some ginkgos are so slow. Now, they are a little slow to get established, but there's some really cool ones, and that lime makes such a big difference. Now, we'd like to get into telling you about the top 25 now, and we're also going to talk about a little bit about the diversity of what you see in each. So this is a great one if you're new to ginkgos to kind of learn what's possible in ginkgos, but also what people like the most. So coming to number 25, we've got Ginkgo Biloba, Robbie's Twist. I love this plant. It's really nice. Robbie's Twist, uh, it, you know, it's a semi-dwarf upright with some contorted foliage. And not only does the foliage contort, you also get a little bit of that spiraling and a little bit twisting in the bark and the branching as well. The leaf itself is a little bit smaller as well. And so it gives a unique texture. This would be an excellent tree to use as a bone tie because of its unique habit. A Ginkgo's... You know, they're extremely malleable, so you can train and shape them however you want. But the good thing about Robbie's twist is it makes that twisting shape by itself. So it architecturally is very interesting out there in the landscape, even as a small to mid-sized upright ginkgo. And a fantastic, you know, fall color as well, being a ginkgo tree. It's going to be one that's easy to grow. It's a selection by our friend Crispin Silva, who brought us Mystic Makawa. He also brought us Robbie's twist, named after his son Robbie. Excellent plant. And you still get that great fall color, but you get something uniquely special with Robbie's Twist. You know, it's got everything you want in a full-size ginkgo, typically about six to eight feet, even in 15 years, so a little bit smaller than many of your uprights. I'd throw it in more of that dwarfer category for a ginkgo tree, but I really like the foliage. I think it really brings something extra to this one, and it just stands out. Like, it's, it's one that when you're in a whole collection of ginkgos, it stands out to you. I, I've seen this one in the conifer gardens at the J.C. Ralston, and it just has a special elegance to it, especially with that little twist to everything. So coming to number 24, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Chotec. Now, I keep talking about gardens, but I can't think of these plants and not think of some of the best specimens in the garden. Uh, this one, there's a gorgeous one we did a, a little video on at Tom Cox Place. And, uh, you know, special place to us. Tom passed last year, but just a good friend to us and so many amazing ginkgos down there in his collection. Uh, Chotec, uh, this is one that has... Uh, some irregular growth in it as well. So you get a little bit of the larger one, 
the larger leaf, but you also get what we call a lace leaf. So you get the more divided, thin foliage as well. So this was found in the Czech Republic as a sport off the cultivar witch's broom. And so you get more of those like tube leaf shapes on the cultivar witch's broom. And it had it, at an early age, it can have almost a nice weeping habit. It can form more of a ball shape as it ages. Chotek, it's just a unique uh, ginkgo, extremely rare. There are mutations happening on ginkgos all over the world. A lot of them, a lot of the really cool ginkgos, though, are coming out of Europe and the Czech Republic. And Chotek is a great example of that. Yeah, uh, we like the term lace leaf ginkgo. I mean, it's it's a little bit of a, a cliche being that we're maple people, but it's a fun way to think about the smaller foliage. Like it has that more divided lacy look to it. And it's kind of fun, especially when those hit that fall color. It just gives you a different texture going on in the garden. Now, ginkgos can handle a good bit of sun. You know, these are going to be no problem sun up to zone eight. High heat, full sun exposures, all day sun in zone eight really isn't a problem for most ginkgos. And you got to be careful with some sun exposures on young or juvenile or newly planted plants. But man, they're tough. Now, Chotac tends to form more of a globular shape. So it tends to have more of a rounded canopy to it over time. Coming to number 23, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Magyar. I think a Hagar the Horrible every time I see this one. You ever see that comic with the little guy that had the horns on? You're probably too young, but they used to be the guys in the funny strips every day when I was a kid. You get the, you get the paper for the funny papers, and it had that little uh, little Viking. He was Hagar the Horrible. <laughs> Magyar makes me think of that every time. Great upright male selection for sure. Now, this was patented because it has a, a fantastic form. More narrow, dense in its canopy, and it is a grafted male, so it doesn't produce the seed. For years, this is actually one that was originally patented, and that patent's now expired, but Magyar is still an excellent upright male ginkgo to use out in the landscape, use as a street tree. I mean, ginkgos are hardy, so they're used in so many different ways, and Magyar is one of the most popular upright male selections. Yeah, we almost consider the shape a little more pyramidal, because it does form a nice canopy to it that's, I wouldn't say narrow, but it doesn't have as broad of a canopy as some, and it does get out there pretty quickly, too. Now, again, lime can be a major factor, But typically, this one's 20 foot in just 15 years. So it is a little bit over a foot of growth a year uh, to an exceptional size. Coming in at number 22, we've got Ginkgo biloba pendula. Now, this is a great plant. The best one of these I've ever seen, and I always talk about the gardens I've seen them in. The best one of these I've ever seen was at the National Botanical Garden in Belgium. And they had a massive specimen of this. Now, I like to think of it a little bit more as horizontula and pendula because it is weeping. But if you stake the, if you put this one on standard, uh, it tends to just go wide, so it can get very wide. There was a specimen there that was grafted like eight, nine feet up, so they'd put it on a massive ginkgo to begin with. Now, I do think that high grafting ginkgos affects the overall size of them greatly. I think the understock continues to feed it. I think there's something there that's a relationship that's a little bit different than it is with maples. I do think that high grafting ginkgos dramatically changes the shape and makes them larger. You're putting on a bigger motor to begin with, and uh, you're not going to keep that shape small if you're putting on a huge ginkgo already. That pendula there was probably 10, 15 feet wide, which I don't think you'll get to in someone's lifetime unless you're putting it on a six-inch caliper, you know, understock to begin with. So interesting way of doing it, but it did tend to make a beautiful kind of umbrella canopy to it. So it went wide and then slightly down. So you had this you know, really cool place in the garden. You could go stand under this and and just be in the shade. It was pretty cool. Now, a lot that we see about ginkgos with their different shapes, I often wonder if this difference in hormones. And so it's really important when you're grafting a ginkgo biloba pendula to choose one that has that horizontal or weeping habit when you're doing your grafting process. You wouldn't want to be grafting pendula off of a terminal branch on a ginkgo biloba pendula. Now, pendula has that real horizontal habit to it And the reason I like this ginkgo tree is because that horizontal slash weeping kind of habit that it has can look very contorted with the way that ginkgos grow. And so this gives a really unique tree out there in the landscape. Even if it's not as straight cascading as something like Ryusin, it is a fantastic tree to use out there for a unique texture and a very unique shape in the garden. Yeah, I like the leaf a lot too. So the leaf is, is divided. It seems to be a little bit more ruffled than many of your straight regular ginkgo leaves. Uh, it's just got a little bit of extra design to it. Looks really cool. Uh, you know, I tell my daughters, they like to pick up leaves because of course they do because they're my kids. And uh, we were showing them how you draw a smiley face on a ginkgo leaf. Well, pendula is perfect for that because you got that heavy division 
and it just looks pretty cool already. It's got the little uh, indentions to it. I had someone in Japan tell me that you could once tell the difference between male and female ginkgos because the males had the pants without the loop in the middle and the females had the skirt. Not doesn't work at all. That, that would be so easy if that was the way you could tell. Doesn't hold up at all. I could think of 20 cultivars right off the bat that, that broke that. Uh, you know, something like Saratoga is going to have a completely different leaf shape, but it's still a male. So it doesn't hold up, but it's an interesting theory. Now, one way you actually can, if you're a botanist, is the flowers. And you, people can tell from the flowers early on on the, on the plant when it flowers. And if they've got nuts, it's a female. <laughs> I believe they're actually fruit. Well, inside of the fruit, there's a nut. And that nut is often a delicacy that's often used uh, in, you know, a lot of Asian salads and different things. We tried them when we were in Japan. Not so much of a fan of them. but yeah, I tried them multiple ways. I tried them steamed. I tried them. A lot of people roast them like a chestnut. It still wasn't my thing. To me, though, that could be like us here in the South. I'm not a fan of boiled peanuts. Right. And eating that the way they cooked it might not be as good as eating just the straight, you know, nut. Well, that's it on was the like a sour boiled peanut. That yeah. is a good example. It tastes like a sour boiled peanut. I didn't like it, but you know, to each their own. Uh, I'm always willing to try something new and interesting. The um, one thing about ginkgos too is they're actually gymnosperm, so there's not anything left in their category. Most of the plants in the gymnosperm category are extinct, so we're often like, throwing them in with conifers. Because the closest relative is really like a pine tree. Right. Which is crazy because, you know, we're talking about a deciduous plant and an evergreen, um, and they're so starkly different. One gives you fall color. <laughs> I mean, so, right. so different. All right, uh, so coming in here at number 21, we've got Ginkgo biloba, Weeping Wonder. Man, this is a plant that you're going to wonder what in the world this plant is, because it is amazing it is a lace leaf ginkgo so this one's really fun you'll see it sometimes sold in europe as mutant weeper but this was an introduction from the united states and the original name and the correct name on it is weeping wonder so if you see mutant weeper out there there's no reason to collect both weeping wonder is another one with that lace leaf like foliage so this one has thinner foliage as its dominant trait you will see a few larger leaves within that but normally the majority of the leaves are that stringy, thin foliage. Almost reminds you a little bit of Kotonoito, how stringy it gets. And it's really cool when it gets in a fall color because all those little strings light up and you're like, oh yeah, that's a ginkgo. Like it's got it. And it's also extremely weeping. So this one will be pendulous and weeping down. It tends to mound its way up in height. And as this makes a, uh, its height to it, it'll get more of that rounded kind of canopy shape to it. Uh, it's unique because it gives those tube leaves, those string leaves, regular leaves and all that mixed in in one ginkgo tree with that same exceptional bright yellow fall color just as hardy as the other ginkgos and again this is basically a lace leaf form of a ginkgo tree it's a great candidate uh, one of the first ones on the list here that would look great in a big pot so you can put this one in a pot let it make more of that umbrella type shape uh, really great plant overall though it just depends on what you want to do with it but it's got so many uses whether it's in a conifer bed or amongst some lace leaf Japanese maples for texture and color. Uh, it's a great plant to be adding to the landscape. And it's one that can take a beating. So you can put this in high sun exposures and it's still going to look great even with that thinner foliage. Coming in here at number 20, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Golden Globe. Now, just as the name implies, this one does have more of a rounded canopy. So Golden Globe has more of a rounded overall habit, typically at around 10 to 12 foot in 15 years. Uh, and excellent plant to be growing and one that's often highly sought after for its shape yeah and so this one makes a really nice larger tree out there in the landscape with that large round canopy as a grafted male selection it's going to give you a lot of bright yellow out there in the fall you know excellent one to be adding if you're looking for something that's going to get about equally as wide as it is tall golden globe tends to be about eight feet wide of, of a 10 foot tall specimen so you're going to get more of a rounded kind of shape overall with it and that rounded shape is exactly what a lot of landscapers and people are looking for. I mean, you could use this one as a street tree. It doesn't require that. You can also put it anywhere you just wanted a bigger canopy ginkgo in the landscape. But it's got a lot of great uses because of that canopy. So coming in at number 19, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Fairmont. Now, this was a selection made from Fairmont Park. And uh, that's a place where Tiny Tim was found. I think Billy Schwartz and Dick Wolf were in there a lot early. There's some... 100 year old specimen kind of plants in that garden uh pretty cool tim and i've been there and walked around now fairmont is known for having a bit of more of a narrow habit 
We don't consider it quite completely columnar like a few selections, but it has a much more arched up and narrow overall approach. So I know that there's a few different cultivars that are similar to Fairmont from Fairmont Park. There's Fastigiata that NJ Acer had gotten from the Vermulans and Vermulans and Sons Nursery. There's a lot of narrow, upright ginkgo trees, but Fairmont is just one that's so prominent that's there in Pennsylvania at Fairmont Park where Tiny Tim was found. And there's so many cool plants that have actually came from that that area. I mean, Philadelphia is just a hotbed for cool plants. And Fairmont just has a narrow form and bright yellow fall color. Another one's great use for a street tree. I mean, you could line your driveway with this one and not have it being touching in the middle. It's got that more arched up approach to it. So it's got a lot of great uses. Accelerated growth rate on this one too, it tend to, I'd say 12 to 15 foot, even in a 10 year period. So, you know, it gets out there, but it doesn't get super wide. I think that's a great way to just enjoy ginkgos because some people have spots in their garden where they want a tall tree that stays narrow, but they don't want to provide a lot of shade out there in the landscape. Well, you can get a large, more narrow growing tree out of something like Fairmont and really be able to enjoy that vertical interest with that bright yellow color. All right, y'all coming in here at our number 18 overall ginkgo for 2023. You got one of my favorites. Now, this one is really unique. You've got Ginkgo Biloba Annie Zebra. Now, this one's fun. I, I first saw this one uh, with plant connoisseur uh, Dennis Dodge. Uh, Dennis is responsible for so many cool plants being in the United States. I don't know if he imported this one directly, but it was certainly one that when he showed it to me, my eyes bugged out a little bit. Annie Zebra gets some funky striations in it. So you get these like striping over top of this very exaggerated leaf. I mean, the leaf itself almost looks like moose antlers. Like it's already got that crazy kind of all direction thing going on. So the leaf shape and the striations within it are what make this one the zebra, right? Now the leaf shape itself is almost like something similar to, uh, almost like bullwinkle. I mean, it has that really funky leaf shape to it, which is just outstanding. And this is a selection from Andre, I don't know how to say his last name, from the Netherlands. He's introduced a lot of really cool ginkgo trees. And, you know, I talked about uh, Czech Republic being a hotbed for ginkgos. Europe, especially around the Netherlands, there's so many cool ginkgos that are coming out of there. And Annie Zebra is one of those collector plants that is just outstanding because it's so unique and different with the foliage itself. Now, I love the variegated ones, the ones with the striping in them, because when they get into fall color, you can still notice some of that striping in it, which I think is extra cool because it's yellow, but it looks a little different than your typical ginkgo yellow because you still have some of that striping going on within it. Really unique plant, typically around six to eight foot in 10 years. Uh, so again, not a gigantic one. Uh, but really, overall, this one just puts on such a weird display. I like how irregular and how large the foliage can get, too. You know what it looks like? It looks like a ghost-like ginkgo. That's like the reticulated form. Because you can see almost like, it looks almost like veins in the leaf, the yeah. way that the, the variegation works in this one. And that's, it, it's such a cool ginkgo tree and one that just looks cartoon-like. Oh, it's super cool. I, I can't get enough of this one. Um, again, it's one that just tends to stand out a little bit more than some of the others. It, it really shows out to me. I think had we had larger numbers in this one, it could be higher up on the list than 18. Coming in at number 17, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Gokushiba. Now, this one's kind of unique. Like, it's got an interesting story behind it. Um, you know, you often find when you go to Japan, uh, trees will be labeled uniquely, and it might not mean what you think you do. And, and then sometimes you, you find out there's just things that are lost in translation. So... Brian Upchurch first brought this one back to the United States. Uh, upon one of his next trips to Japan, he went back to the same nursery, asked for the same ginkgo, by the same name, and they said, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so, but, but one of the cool things about this, it is one of the smallest leaf forms out there. And something was just lost in translation, clearly. The, the crazy thing is, is you know, he asked other people what this name actually meant. And people were like, I don't know what that means. That doesn't sound like it means anything. But then he took us and showed us the tag where the guy had written Go Kushoba on the tag when he'd gotten the tree originally. So yeah. it's like, <laughs> what just happened? Very rare one to find in the trade. It is a dwarf with tiny foliage. Now, because of that, obviously, ginkgos are great for bonsai. This one's going to be a highly sought after one for bonsai because of that small uh, foliage. I mean, the foliage is typically less than a quarter size, which is really unique considering ginkgos can get, you know, big foliage on them. This one is quite interesting, though. And when it gets into fall color, it just looks, 
it looks very dainty almost in a way. It's got that little bitty foliage and it just looks interesting. Perfect plant for a fairy garden or an area where you want a ginkgo that's going to have a bigger look like a, like a tiny railroad garden or conifer garden where you want something that's going to have a little bit more... Uh, a little less size to it, but still have that ginkgo look to it. Where something like Robbie's Twist has smaller foliage but a flatter leaf, the interesting thing about Gokushaba is that the leaf cups upward a little bit with that smaller foliage. Uh, it is so awesome and so special. One, because it's super rare. Give it some lime, though. A lot of these smaller leaf ginkgo selections, they're slower growing. So if you give them the lime to allow them to get established in the landscape, you're going to have a lot of these smaller leaf selections be a little more vigorous for you and perform better in the garden. People always ask too, can ginkgo go in shade? And I recommend at least four to six hours of sun a day. If you're getting less than that, what you're going to get is a very jade colored, dark green tree that's very slow growing. So some of these dwarfs that are already tiny, you're not doing many favors if you put them into a heavy, heavy shade environment because they're just going to be a little slower growing even. So I recommend at least four to six hours of sun a day, that's going to pick up the growth rate on these and give you a like just a better overall looking ginkgo. Coming in at number 16, we've got ginkgo biloba, Jehoshaphat. Yeah, this is a fun one. This is a broom uh, one of our friends found. It was Rich Larson at the Dawes Arboretum. And when he saw it, he said, jumping Jehoshaphats. <laughs> <laughs> he's a character. I think he's retired now, but what a nice guy. We went up to the Dawes Arboretum and toured around with him before. And uh, cool plant, though. In that mid-sized dwarf range, a little bit bigger than some of the other dwarfs, but it has such a great shape to it. Now, while Rich Larson is from the Dawes Arboretum, he found this at Spring Grove Cemetery and Arboretum. And at this place, there are lines of ginkgos, and each one is numbered. And so I believe uh, Ginkgo Biloba Jehoshaphat is also known as Spring Grove. I believe it's 85 or 87, number 80. And that correlates with the exact Ginkgo that's out there where Jehoshaphat came from. There's so many other cool plants that are that originated as witches brooms or sports from Spring Grove Cemetery and Arboretum. I believe there's at least five that have been introduced so far. And so Jehoshaphat... One of those ones that has a really nice rounded canopy can get a little bit more of a flat top with it as it ages, but a good mid-sized ginkgo. And it was selected after they evaluated it. They said, this tree's got a really good upright, small rounded canopy to it. I like this one a lot. It's more than that like six foot and 10 years kind of size. And a lot of the branching does kind of arch up a little bit. I kind of think of it a little bit like Jerry Schwartz and that it's a dwarf, but it kind of looks kind of columnar still too. So coming in at number 15, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Grindstone. Okay, now this is an excellent one. Uh, Tim actually did a video where he traveled to the original Grindstone. Uh, it's had a few different names. You've, this one's been sold under Grindstone Lake. Um, we do believe it to be the same plant as Sky Tower, the patented one as well. Now, this is from Fly, Ohio at the Fly Exit. And there were about six or seven different Ginkgos that were planted at that Fly Exit. And we're talking about literally a rest stop. And all around there, there are these amazing ginkgos that are extremely narrow. Then they were planted. And the real question is, is these were planted cultivars before. I often it's hard to say if they're grafted or not. There's so much going out at the base of them. They could be from seed, but it's almost impossible to know. Well, I often wonder if they could be the original Mayfield. Because Mayfield, Ohio, isn't far from there. Ginkgo Bloba Mayfield was originally a more columnar selection. Mm-hmm. And so I often wondered if that's not the original cultivar, but no one can tell right now. I mean, there's a lot of growth low, though. I think they're probably from seed. Now, the interesting thing about these ginkgos is all seven of these things are narrow, so they could be from seed. They could have been a former cultivar from before that a landscaper planted, but now they're at Grindstone Exit in Fly, Ohio, and literally there's a grindstone sitting there. And that's where it gets the name of Grindstone from. It's from that Grindstone at the Fly Exit. Definitely go check out that video. Tim had a great cameraman. Him and Carla took a little vacation. His wife went up there and filmed that. And it's kind of a fun one. Uh, that's back when we were filming everything on our phones. But you did, still did a pretty good video out of that. And it's just interesting to see. I, I, I don't know if they're all share some lineage or if they're all different. It's hard to say. Uh, but I would say Grindstone, probably one of the best columnar forms out there. Now, this was a selection that got into the nursery trade, I believe, through a lot of locals, including Bob Lipka. Bob Lipka is the one who told us exactly where this tree originated. It has been trademarked by another name as well in the nursery trade. And so it has two names in the nursery trade currently, but Grindstone was the original name. 
All right, coming in here at number 14, we got another one with two names. <laughs> so we'll get into it. Sometimes different people claim the same tree, so they each try to put a name on it. That happens a lot. You'll find that reoccurring in the nursery trade. And we, we, we try to uh, honor everybody we can with those. But Ginkgo biloba Chris's dwarf, uh, sometimes also referred to as Munchkin. So, you know, probably Munchkin's probably more out there under Munchkin because people like that name more. Uh, we were told Chris's Dwarf was the original name on this one. Another one with really tiny foliage. So this one has some of the most small leaves you'll ever see on a ginkgo. Great small plant if you're wanting to put it out and, you know, have a ginkgo but not a large one. And then one that has that foliage according to the size. So a six foot tall tree that still has tiny foliage on it. And a six foot tall tree would probably be about four to five foot wide. I mean, it stays fairly compact in its nature. Again, these smaller leaf ginkgo selections, give them sunlight and give them lime to get established. One, because they've got smaller leaves, that means they've got less chlorophyll production. If you can keep some vigor in them, you're going to have the best success in these smaller leaf ginkgo selections. And if you plant these in just pure acidic soil and you don't give them a lot of fertilizer or lime, you know, you may get a slower growing plant that starts to dwindle. Give it some lime, and that tree should take off for you. I mean, that's been my trick that I've always seen with a lot of these small leaf ginkgo trees. Chris's dwarf, though, a nice, small, compact little munchkin out there for your garden. Yeah, this one looks great in the container, although I do like it better in the ground. I find that the smaller leaf ones are a little better growing in the ground. Just getting them in the soil, they tend to be a little bit more cold tolerant, a little bit more durable overall, and they seem to do you know a little bit better in the landscape. Munchkin is beautiful. Like this one, Chris's Dwarf Munchkin, no matter what you call it, it is a nice, compact, dense, small form with exactly what you're looking for if you want little foliage. Like it exactly encompasses that. And it looks great in fall color too. It almost looks like little teardrops. Like it really lights up. Yeah, it's a really cool little dwarf ginkgo. And going from one dwarf ginkgo to another at number 13, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Gnome. Gnome's a great one. Again, there's something to be said about having a great name. Like Gnome, you know, it's got that mythological creature in there. Everybody loves a tree with a great name. Uh, so Gnome fits, and it fits well with what Ginkgo do. Typically, we list this one at around five to six foot, even in 10 years. Great rounded canopy to it, and just an overall exceptional plant. Uh, this one was actually found from seed, so it's not a broom. And a uh, really good overall plant. It's actually a selection that was found in Tennessee, um, and it's crazy that this has that broom-like characteristic that people find with many other ginkgos, but it was from seed, so it's got that genetics in there. Uh, often makes me wonder if it was, you know, happened to be a seed that came off of a witch's broom, mm -hmm. um, just because the way it it's, has that unique habit, or if it's just a natural compact dwarf, but gnome fits in those small places in the garden, and... It just has that perfectly, almost rounded canopy almost every time. Now, Gnome actually has some large leaves for a dwarf, too. So it has kind of a large, round leaf, even though it has a smaller overall shape. Kind of gives it a bubbly appearance to it, but I, I like this one a lot. I think it's an excellent tree to be growing. And I do find this one to be a great candidate for container gardening. It's vigorous. It, it looks great in a big pot. You kind of get that little canopy going on over top of the container. You can get a decorative pot that kind of offsets your fall colors and your spring colors on your ginkgo. They're tough as all get out, so you can put them on a deck or a patio, let them take that high heat exposure and look awesome. Uh, but it's a tight, compact dwarf that really has a lot of good uses. I think a lot of people could grow this out in you know, the city in a container like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about this plant is you can grow it out there with your tomatoes and everything. And as those leaves fall off in the fall, you can collect those leaves, let them dry out, and you can make ginkgo tea out of the foliage. And you can do this in any of the ginkgos. But some of these dwarfs make great container plants that you could actually do this with as well in your garden or, you know, in your container garden and make ginkgo tea out of the, the foliage. And ginkgo is supposed to be good for your memory and it's supposed to have all these great medicinal benefits as well. And that comes just from the leaves of ginkgo. I mean, ginkgos are so surprising and so beneficial in every way. Yeah, and that's true of any of the ginkgos on this list. You can actually make some ginkgo tea out of any of these. But the container plants make it really easy to harvest. So you can have that on a patio and somewhere like New York, because this is a three through nine plant. Now, being in a pot does take it down a zone, so be conscious of it freeze drying in a, uh, a slightly, you know, a colder zone. So be conscious of it going down one more zone colder. But super easy plant to grow and a great patio plant. Coming in at number 12, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Folkert Select. I know a lot of people that say this is their favorite plant we grow. It's a fun ginkgo. Um, 
you know, it, it's a mid-sized tree, but I think what captures people's imagination about this one is the leaf shape. It has a heavily incised leaf, so the leaf divides, uh, you know, strongly back into the middle of the leaf. Great upright male, 15 foot in 10 years. Smaller overall foliage typically too on this one. The foliage doesn't get too big, but what people like it is that leaf is kind of more ruffled and it just looks like a little bit more intricate going on on leaf. It almost has that jagged jade thing going on, but yeah. on a smaller leaf. I mean, it's it looks almost like it's got extra ploidy in the foliage itself. That small uh, foliage just grabs it, adds a unique texture out there in the landscape. You know, when originally when this tree was coming into America, it had the name uh, Fulcrate Select, but at the same time, there was one that had Colster Select. I think someone just mislabeled them because they right. ended up being the same plant, and Fulcrate Select was the original name. Yeah, great plant though, and it really just makes a great palette. You hear me say this a lot, but that that interesting leaf looks excellent when it gets into fall color. I mean, it really just glows, and that more frilly, kind of intricate leaf. It just it just seems to have a little something extra going on. Yeah, it's just got that unique texture, and it's got a good upright form. So it typically develops a good strong leader that goes upwards and makes a good small tree out there in the landscape and garden with that smaller foliage. Again, this would make an excellent uh, tree for bonsai. You could do some rooted cuttings of this and make a fantastic, really unusual bonsai forest at. I mean, you see those bonsai forests in, that are just so amazing. This would be an excellent candidate to do a bonsai forest with because it's so unique and special and that small foliage. All right, y'all, coming in here at number 11, we got Ginkgo Biloba Spring Grove. Now, we mentioned Jehoshaphat before. This is another witch's broom that originated at Spring Grove Cemetery and Arboretum. And this is the original. It's called Ginkgo Biloba Spring Grove because of that. Ah, oh, really great plant, too. There's a great one of these. Um, there's several of them around. I mean, the Morris Arboretum has a beautiful selection of this. There is an amazing one of these at, at our gardens here that we call uh, Hillstone Arboretum at our uncle's place. We've got a nice one on the bank, and we kind of have it over top of a Ryusin, and we've let that Ryusin kind of take the entire bank. And what's special about that is when it gets into fall color, we have that orange, but then we have that bright yellow beside of it. So it's a little bit more of a columnar shape with Spring Grove. You know, it's a dwarf, so it's not super columnar, but it's more narrow and short. So you have that, that just spark of yellow going on beside all that carpet from the uh, Ryusin. Yeah, I just like Spring Grove because it seems to fit in a lot of more narrow spaces. Because of that, you can get almost that Christmas tree kind of shape out of Spring Grove with that compact, rounded habit. It, it's such an amazing tree. A lot of these selections from Spring Grove got into the nursery trade by Rich Larson uh, through the Dawes Arboretum. And the Dawes Arboretum has the National Ginkgo Collection. And so there in Newark, Ohio... They've got so many different ginkgos all around their gardens, and you can actually walk through those gardens, see mature specimens of many of these ginkgos, and be able to start to learn the differences between each and every ginkgo. And seeing Spring Grove there, that's one of the things that got started getting me real interested in so many of the other ginkgo trees that we could actually have in cultivation. Great plant. Uh, coming in here at number 10, another of my favorite ginkgo for leaf shape. We've got Ginkgo biloba, jagged jade. Now, just as the name implies, this one has a very dark green leaf that has a lot of intricate, uh, uh, kind of like a jaggedness to it. So it has a lot of serration around the outer part of the leaf. I think this one looks the most like something a dinosaur would eat. Like it, it's got that like old world quality to it. Like this looks like something, you know, Douglas Justice would find on the top of a mountain. It just looks otherworldly. I think it might be, I mean, if you were to compare it to like a maple, I would compare it to something like Ragos or Ruby Ridge. And that's because I think this tree is a different ploidy than many of the other ginkgo trees. What that means is it has a different number of chromosomes, often more chromosomes that can give it that thicker texture, uh, the thicker bark, and it gives you typically a thicker branching as well. And Jagged Jade definitely looks like that with a ginkgo tree. You see the veins are real prominent in the foliage, although they're the same color as the rest of the leaf. It just gives it this look to it that this tree is out of this world. And Jagged Jade is a selection by Crispine Silva that is just outstanding. I mean, it, it looks like something that is just crazy when it comes to a ginkgo tree. 
Yeah, there's another one that's a variegated sport off this from Crispin that uh, we probably didn't do enough numbers in on this list this year, but Jagged Jester has that variegated part to a Jagged Jade. Both great plants. And, that, uh, and Jagged Jester's also been known under the name of Jaded Jester. I think the original name that Crispin sent us, he wrote the tag Jagged Jester. Later, it got out under also Jaded Jester. They're the exact same plant. They're both variegated sport, the same variegated sport off of Jagged Jade. But the unvariegated form Jagged Jade is outstanding. The thing I like a lot about the variegated forms, though, if it reverts, it's just back to Jagged Jade, which right. is an amazing plant. And Jagged Jade, just as an upright ginkgo, six foot in 10 years, upright, dense, unique foliage that has jagged edges to it. I mean, this is a ginkgo tree that's going to grab your attention. You know, one thing I've noticed about this one is that instead of that school bus yellow color, you get more of a pale yellow color on this in the fall. It is slightly different. Yeah. So it is one of the few ginkgos that have a slight difference in the fall color. It's perhaps more of that, you know, light lemon yellow kind of color on the fall color. You always wonder if this doesn't have more tetraploidy characteristics or something to it too. It is a little shorter and the leaf is a little thicker than most. It feels a little bit more leathery to the touch than some of the other ones on this list. I mean, the leaf itself is actually thicker than many of the other ginkgos. And so out of all the ginkgo trees, this is one of the few that would include this one with its variegated counterpart as one of the few fall color differences I've actually seen with ginkgo trees. Coming here at number nine, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Sunstream. Yeah, high on the list. Uh, this one has some of that swirling variegation within it. Sunstream, one of the most popular variegated ginkgos we do. Um, this being an upright male with some unique variegation styles, you kind of get that light pale yellow to white swirling going on within the green. Uh, now, this is the most unstable of the forms, the variegation, this style. Forms like um, Snow Cloud and, and Ginkgo Biloba uh, Beige and gold, we'll talk about more, are a little bit more stable. But this one's so striking, you have to grow it. And of the variegated ginkgos that have the white or cream stri striping in the foliage itself, that's not snow cloud, I mean, that's not snow cloud or beige and gold, this one has some of the most stable of right. that variegation. That's the reason why we produce it, is because it's the most stable of the unstable variegated ginkgos. I love how yellow the secondary color can be on the green. Like you'll get stages where it's more cream, but I love it when it's like a light kind of neon chartreuse green on green. Like you can get some cool shades of yellow within this one. Uh, just really nice. Sunstream, beautiful plant. Again, this one's going to work three through nine, typically more of a six to eight foot plant in 10 years. Um, it, it's gorgeous though. I absolutely love it. I do recommend growing this one in more sun which is counterintuitive to a lot of people. Like it's kind of like carnival and that it's, it's variegated. So you want to put it in shade. The green parts tend to be more vigorous and heavy shade. So if you're growing this one in sun, I find that variegated ginkgos of this style tend to stay more variegated in more sunlight. I, I would say that's completely true. It's so unusual with some of these unstable <laughs> ginkgo variegated types. Again, sunstream is the most stable of those. But you can go out there and the parts that aren't variegated, sometimes you can tag them and the next year they'll be variegated. Right. I mean, I still recommend pruning them out, uh, the unvariegated parts and focusing it on. It starts to be a branch. Yeah, definitely. it starts to be a branch. But it's crazy how the same leaf from one year to another can actually change on the variegation on these ginkgos. So with variegated ginkgos, avoid a, a lot of fertilizer. You want to go low on the nitrogen with this one. You could still throw that lime out there, but you don't want to go with a heavy, high nitrogen fertilizer. That can tend to wash them out. And again, at least at least six hours of sun on any of your variegated ginkgos, you're gonna you're gonna find that 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 colors them up way better than heavy shade. If they get into heavy shade, it's almost like the green part takes over. It's like I got you, hold on, in the shade. So you, you want to be in some more sunlight. That tends to be one of the better factors there for the variegated. I just remember that one of the probably about the fifth or sixth time we ran across this cultivar, someone had it tagged as Ginkgo Biloba sunscreen. And <laughs> I was like, sunscreen? Do you mean sunstream? They're like, oh, it's one of those new variegated types. I'm like, okay. <laughs> it sounds like finally one named after me, sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's so easy for a tree to get mislabeled in the nursery trade. Right. So easy. That's why we love just labeling a plant with a, with a hanging tag and making sure that's always on there. Sometimes those handwritten tags are a little bit harder to read. Uh, but Sunstream, this is such a great tree. 
it's striking, it's unique. The yellow on the green variegation is something that's going to command your attention, especially if you're a plant a lover uh, for variegated plants. All right, coming in here at number eight, we've got one of our best upright males for popularity. I mean, everybody knows this plant. Everybody gets it. Again, I think of Tom Cox when I think of this one. Uh, Ginkgo biloba saratoga. Classic upright male ginkgo with a great leaf shape. I mean, we think of ginkgos as the maidenhair tree. That's what a lot of people call them. I think of this particular style leaf as even more maidenhair. Maybe because it looks more like maidenhair ferns. But I think of this particular style leaf as even more maidenhair than the rest. And the leaf shape is very, it's very flat. And it comes to a nice rounded edge around the edge. Mm -hmm. But it's still kind of flat around that on the older growth. The new growth on Saratoga, on the other hand, can look very dissected. And so the new growth looks starkly different from the older growth on Saratoga. It's a selection from Saratoga a Research Center in California. And they introduced this plant, and I'm so glad they did. It really has a unique texture, and it's a good, vigorous, upright male selection that many people can grow in the garden. It's got a great form and bright yellow fall color. Uh, even the photo we use is from Tom. I know uh, Jim Putnam of Hort Tube, he went there and he did garden answers. And of course he stood in front of the Saratoga because it is a showstopper of a plant. Uh, I just love it. I, every time I go down there, I have to check this one out. It gets some incredible fall colors and it just has everything you want for an upright male with a dense canopy you can see into. Um, but it's got that fullness to it. It's got the perfect size canopy. It's kind of like the, one of the quintessential shapes. It really has a lot of what you're looking for. Um, and it gives a good diversity to some of the other most popular male ginkgo types. I, that leaf shape and overall texture, I think it just gives it something extra. I mean, you, you tend to have not your most thin tree. You, you can see into the structure, but it's full and dense and it has more of a rounded overall canopy. It's kind of exactly what you think of when you like draw a cartoon of a tree. I mean, it's one of the few upright male clones that has a distinct uh, foliage difference, a distinct foliage difference, mm. and still makes a large tree for the landscape and garden. And so for a full-sized male ginkgo, this is an exceptional tree. I mean, distinctive when you're up close and a gorgeous tree from a distance. Uh, this is a tree that many landscapers can use out in the garden because it's easy to grow, it's hardy, and it truly reaches that cultivar status for me. I mean, there's so many ginkgos that are in the nursery trade. We have over 150. And you start looking at the ginkgos and you're like, oh, this is a dwarf. This one's a narrow. This is... And there's... You start getting less and less on the actual distinctive differences until you start getting narrowing down the list. And that's one of the great things about our tw top 25 list that we're doing today is you can start to narrow down this list and truly see different characteristics with each of, each of these cultivars. And Saratoga, it really stands out as a cultivar to me. All right, coming in here at number seven. We're all the way up at number seven, y'all. We got Ginkgo Biloba Boobs. <laughs> all right, all right. Ginkgo Biloba Chichi. Now, Dr. Dirt tries to clean this one up. I know he might be responsible. It's actually originally spelled C-H-I-C-H-I. -H -I, and, you know, for lack of a better term, someone was just being immature. And they, they, it has these protrusions that come off the tree that are rounded. And Dr. Durr's like, no, no, no. The original name in, in Japan is TSI, TSI, Chi Chi. No, no, it isn't. The people, people know this was called boobs because it looks like boobs hanging on a tree. Uh, no one, no one's fooling nobody here. We can clean it up. We can try to be as mature as hey, we want, but it's named after boobs. Hey Matt, what was Ginkgo Biloba Dingling named after? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They're real mature at the Ginkgo Biloba Name and Institute. Whoever's over there, <laughs> we got Dingling and we got Chi Chi. We know both those were named for their, I like, so I like to call it stalactite. You know, like in a cave you have stalagmites and stalactites. Well, Ginkgos have the stalactite like growth and it's hanging down protrusions. So some of them look more uh, globular like Chi Chi and some of them look longer. Oh, like dangling. Yeah. So you'll see these a lot and it's a reoccurring trait in ginkgo seed. So you'll even see it when we were at uh, ginkgo alley there in Japan. Some of those uh, from seed exhibited this trait because of that Chi Chi can get a little mixed up in the trade. There are different ginkgos out there that will exhibit this trait. Not all of them are called Chi Chi and that leads to some confusion. Chi Chi itself, the, the correct form is a very much a globe shape. You want a real, you know, smaller overall tree with a nice dome to it. Yeah, and it just gives such an interesting bark texture as this tree ages as well. You start to get that bark formations. 
uh, that start to show up on the tree as it ages. Just given that ginkgo is something a little bit extra out there in the landscape and garden, you mentioned that ginkgo alley video. Uh, we, we did a whole video on Ginkgo uh, Alley called Eco Namaki Avenue. Go check that out if you haven't seen it on our YouTube channel. Make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel as well, but go check out that video specifically. In Tokyo, there's this amazing avenue, and there's Ginkgos up and down the sides of it, and it's basically a festival around their fall color. The Ginkgos there are manicured to have perfect shapes, and some of those Ginkgos display this kind of chichi bark protrusions that we're talking about with this specific cultivar ginkgo biloba chichi now the original cultivar great like i said more of a rounded canopy to it it would be a really fun plant to see done as an older bonsai because of those kind of gnarly protrusions that come out of it some of them can look a little bit more stalactite like some of them can look a little bit more rounded when they're starting out but it is a reoccurring trait on chichi that you'll always see with these with age sometimes they have to be about eight years old before you start to kind of get those kind of you know protrusions coming off of them but it's a great looking plant that as it ages just has an extra interesting characteristic to it uh, along with its overall rounded canopy coming in at number six we've got ginkgo biloba jade butterflies one of our most classic upright males i mean there's 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 really this one sells out quickly and for good reason it's right in that mid-size range for height so it's not the tallest it's not the smallest but it comes in right in the middle for an upright male and it kind of fits what a lot of people are looking for in a ginkgo i've often wondered what the origin was of ginkgo below but jade butterflies would love to hear that if anyone actually has the true story behind it uh jade butterflies though it's a little bit tighter and denser so you know one might think that it might be from a witch's broom either from seed or broom itself but it has a nice upright form to it and it stays shorter and denser and more compact fitting in a lot of people's landscapes with that same bright school bus yellow fall color people love on some of these larger ginkgos as well. It's one of the most usable ginkgos because it doesn't get to be an astronomical size right away. It's got that slower growth rate and it still gives you that same hardiness that all the other ginkgos give you. Great plant. I mean, this one really fits a lot of uses. It's dense. It's full. Um, a lot of people will, will kind of make a little bit higher break in it and stake it up so you kind of get a little bit more height to it before that canopy starts. If not, it tends to be very dense and full low. You know, the leaves look like jade butterflies. That's really where the name originates. You get that perfect ginkgo shape that's heavily divided. looks like butterfly wings. There is a variegated form, again, found by our friend Crispa called Majestic Butterflies that is a variegated form of this. Another great plant, uh, you know, a little bit unstable there, but also just beautiful in its overall characteristics. I think because of that name, really, that really helps this one too. I mean, it, it, it looks like jade butterflies. The, the foliage has that butterfly type feel to it. They look, they kind of arch up a little bit too. So it looks like butterflies, maybe even their wings starting to come together a little bit. It, it just captures the imagination and it's perfectly named. Coming in at number five, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Snow Cloud. Now, this one probably put up the most numbers for the least amount of time. Uh, you know, this one kind of probably didn't have as high numbers as number one, but if we have the right numbers, this one normally switches with one and two. Like it's normally at the top of the list. Had we had a larger set of these, I could easily see it being number one. Uh, Snow Cloud, my favorite variegated ginkgo. Uh, we originally got this from Barry Yinger under the name Frosty. Uh, it came from Japan and Barry had that name on it. Now, unannounced to us, other people got it into the country also and named it Snow uh, cloud. Now that got out there quicker under that name. So we dropped the name Frosty. If you ever see this tree under the name Frosty, I do believe them to be the same plant from Japan. Outstanding ginkgo. This is a small male ginkgo with, I would say the most striking variegation, especially when you see this when it's full splendor. I mean, I, I've, I've shown this at presentations and had audible gasps when it comes up on screen. People, people audibly were like, whoa. I mean, like the, the audience reacted like they're watching, you know, a Marvel Avengers trailer here. Like people screamed, like they were like, what the heck just happened? It's one of those trees that kind of gets that guttural reaction to it. Like people cheered. I love it. I love the colors of it. Uh, I think it's so interesting because I've also never had this one revert. So you don't want to over push it with fertilizers. It tends to make a five to six foot small tree more in your traditional ginkgo form, but in a smaller overall setting. Now this one has a cloudy like variegation and it is outstanding because of that. You typically get a little more white towards the edges of this foliage, especially as the chlorophyll is more towards the center of the leaf where the leaf stem comes in. 
but this tree just has a striping variegation that is so thick that it looks very cloudy overall. To me, it is the best of the variegated ginkgos because it's the most variegated mm -hmm. and it's the most stable. I mean, put this out next to a red Japanese maple lace leaf. Put it out next to some of your more colorful dwarfs or a conifer garden. I mean, it literally, it, it merits your attention. Like once people have seen this one, people come to us, they go, do you have this? Like, uh, it, it's almost like a, a rumor going around with landscapers. They're like, I've heard of this ginkgo. Do you have it? And then you show them a picture of it and they're like, it's real. I mean, it looks so cool. And, and it, it really just gets kind of a visceral reaction. It's, it's interesting when we, we drop it on people that hadn't seen it before. Uh, you know, don't sleep on this one. It's amazing. I do recommend four to six hours of sun at least for its best color. Uh, it'll be a little slower growing and a little less striking in heavy, heavy shade. But I mean, wow. Early morning sun, late day shade is kind of perfect for this one, I find. Great in a container garden, great in the landscape. But put this one out in your maple collection. I mean, a lot of people listen to us are maple collectors. This is going to have all the flash you want. I mean, put this next to a Geisha Gone Wild. It, it, it's it's otherworldly. Coming in at number four, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Autumn Gold. You know, again, this one is normally at the top of the list. It's, uh, you know, this one fights for those top three spots a lot as well. Um, I, I'm actually shocked to see this one as far down as four. Autumn Gold is kind of the quintessential upright male ginkgo i mean i wouldn't throw it in there as blood good but it's it's out there like this is the one people ask for by name the most um i was driving through you know chapel hills campus one time and i literally hit the curb like it was in perfect fall color the original trees on the university of chapel hills campus and i mean tim tim was like keep going keep going you're gonna get a wreck like i literally hit the curb looking at this tree and I, I mean, my jaw was on the ground. It was there. It's a very old tree there on that campus. And my jaw was just on the ground. I know that whenever I would have classes at UNC, at the University of North Carolina, our professors would be talking in our biology classes about autumn gold. Right. They'd be talking about this ginkgo tree and they'd say, you've got to check it out. It's amazing. And it got introduced there from the tree on campus at UNC Chapel Hill and it is just a fantastic upright male ginkgo that goes to gold in the autumn. It's got a great shape to it. And so it's an easy tree that people said, hey, this is a phenomenal male selection. It's not producing the fruit. Let's get this tree in the landscape and get people to start enjoying what they love about ginkgos. Now, I often wonder, some people say that ginkgos can switch sex. Some people say that um, you know, it's easy for somebody to lose the graft and let the rootstock continue on. I've heard people say, oh, I think autumn gold is a female. I'll tell you, I've never seen fruit on that original, and it is an old specimen. And so the original autumn gold there at that landscape never had any fruit on it. Now, there are things about ginkgos that are a little bit different than, you know, maples, for instance. If you have a crazy weather occurrence, you may have a small branch mm -hmm. that mutates and that small branch is female for a season and produces fruit. And that can definitely happen where there can be a mutation mm -hmm. on a ginkgo tree. But it's not common, and it's not something that's going to happen that frequently. There's also things with ginkgo biloba autumn gold. It's kind of like blood good. Unfortunately, there are nurserymen producing ginkgo seedlings, throwing the name autumn gold on ginkgo trees suffers from its own popularity it suffers from its own popularity because people are asking for autumn gold and they say well these ginkgos turn gold in the autumn <laughs> right. that's not a grafted male they're, they're, it's not the clone autumn gold and so make sure you know if you're getting autumn gold get us from here at mrmaple.com we've got grafted true uh autumn golds that are not going to be females that are going to be a fantastic tree for your garden all right, y'all, all the way up to number three on the top ginkgos of 2023. Again, we're giving you this insider information. This is behind the curtain. If you're liking this kind of thing, be sure to give us a five-star Google review or go grab us on your favorite podcast platform. Watch us on YouTube. We're always putting out new videos every single day under the Mr. Maple Show. Uh, you can give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform, too. That goes a long way toward getting us out there to other folks. All right, y'all, at number three, we've got Ginkgo Biloba Beijing Gold. Now, this one's a little bit of a shocker to me. I, we must He must have put up more shots to beat some of the other ones, but it is one of my all-time favorites. I would say this is my second favorite variegated ginkgo after Snow Cloud. It gives you a lot of what you like about Snow Cloud, but in a golden format. Like, I mean, this could be like golden. You know, it just has that striations of like bright yellow where the Snow Cloud has the white. I've literally taken this one to a garden show before, 
and had people get confrontational because I had like 15 of them. And once about six of them sold, people started counting how many people were in front of them in line. <laughs> and it got a little heated. I'm not going to lie. People got a little heated. I'm like, hey, we can ship these to you. We offer them all the time. This is when we're much smaller. We used to do garden shows. There was like literally people going like, I'm seven back and you better not be getting that autumn gold or it's on. Like there was some threats made for autumn, for, for uh, Beijing gold because this thing is so next level. In the springtime, it can literally just have a green center with yellow around the edge. The new growth flushes with the striations during the summer are outstanding. Uh, this also is it's just another ginkgo that's extremely stable. I was told by David Bomer, who ginkgo biloba uh, Damer, uh, ginkgo biloba David's named after, and he said that his family and his nursery introduced Beijing and gold. You know, I went to ask him what the origin was behind it, and I haven't heard back. But Beijing gold is such an outstanding tree. And part of that makes me wonder if, you know, in Europe, they often say they introduced it. Doesn't necessarily mean that they found the tree. Sometimes that means that they introduced it to the market in Europe. Maybe. And and so that, that could be a different way of looking at it. But Beijing gold, it's one of the most outstanding variegated ginkgo trees. Stable, unique, different. The yellow that it can provide in the springtime, it's outrageous. I mean, when you have the leaves that are mostly yellow with a little bit of green coming in from the leaf stem, when the chlorophyll is coming into the foliage, it puts on a show all by itself. And to me, it's one of the best spring interest ginkgos. I mean, it can glow. Like if you catch it in the right time in the early spring, the whole tree is literally glowing. Uh, typically around eight to 10 foot, even in 15 years, it's kind of that mid size range. Now we always give a time for our sizes because there are ginkgos in this world that are very old. There's some ginkgos that date back 500 years are still alive today. They'll outlive us all. A, a, a grafted, happy ginkgo tree should live to be well over 100 years old. Uh, and so they can continue to grow with size. I was in Augusta, and there was a ginkgo tree planted in Augusta that me and Amy went to look at. And it was planted to commemorate George Washington's visit to Augusta. So there's some ginkgo that have been around a minute. I know me and you went to the University of Virginia's campus and saw one planted by Thomas Jefferson yeah. himself. And the ginkgo is ginormous. And I'm standing underneath it, and I look like a little ant in the photo. And I mean, ginkgos, just like other tr like Japanese maples, they can live for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And guys, you know, these are amazing plants. They're things that are from the fossil ages and you can plant one in your garden and enjoy it in smaller spaces. All right. No shocker to see this one at number two. It is always popular. Uh, you know, it kind of looks like Shrek's here. That's why it gets the name. But Ginkgo Biloba Troll. Now, he was an ogre, not a troll, so it doesn't really fit perfectly. But you get that little Shrek ear thing going on with troll. Like, it's got that weird troll ear. It's all green, and it's got that perfect little crinkly shape to it. Uh, it's a fun one. People can look at it, and they go, hey, that looks, that looks like something I want in my garden. It's got the name troll to it. Uh, it's already kind of fun and whimsical. So, you know, anytime you get a mythological character like a troll in the garden, that's going to be popular. But it's not just in a name with this one. This one is a nice, compact dwarf that just has everything you want in a dwarf ginkgo. I, when I think about this now, I think about the Halloween special that uh, Sean and Corbin did with, with, and they mentioned Troll in there. It's funny because, you know, we do so many videos constantly, but certain trees just bring back a memory of something that may have just been funny for you at the moment. Like Usagumo, I always think back to Matt dressed up at our Halloween special in a Batman costume as we're describing Usagumo. Go watch Corbin and Sean's Thanksgiving special in 2023. It's a, it's it's an instant classic. Their Halloween special, it's... us oh, a Thanksgiving, Halloween special. Yeah, their Halloween special, it's a classic. You're going to have to watch it, and you'll have fond memories of each of those plants that they describe, especially the red dragon that's floating in the air. <laughs> hey, I, I'm always online now, right? We're on so many different platforms, so I always say don't be a troll, but do buy a troll. Like if you're going to troll somebody, troll them in your garden with a ginkgo biloba troll. It, you know, it's a, just a great plant. This one's going to typically be, you know, three to four feet by three to four feet wide, even in a 10, 15 year span. Nice, compact overall habit to it. Tends to have a rounded canopy to it as a dwarf, which is perfect. It's an introduction by Germany and uh, from Germany. Um, and it's just a good overall plant. I like it. It can fit in those railroad gardens, those fairy gardens, those conifer beds. Really easy because it's dwarfer, compact shape. It gives you everything you love about ginkgo, but rounded, small, and dwarf. It's got that, that it factor whenever it comes to a garden. It's got a great name, and it's, got a great, it's a great tree. 
And so overall, this is a tree that's easy to use, and you should definitely try it out in your garden. Now, this is another one that was found as a witch's broom, which I like because it one it kind of locks in those traits of being a little smaller, but also witch's brooms are infertile, so you don't even have to worry about this one ever switching. Uh, it's definitely a distinctly male, and uh, witch's brooms just give you a little extra security on that too. Coming in at number one, we've got Ginkgo Biloba American. Guys, this one is always popular. I think it's the quintessential dwarf ginkgo. Um, you've heard us talk a lot about Piet Vergelt. He puts Peve on a lot of his trees. From my understanding, American is named after his wife. And uh, I guess, you know, my wife would say, you better not put that in signature on my name. You're just going straight on it. So maybe that's why he put American on it. Uh, beautiful tree and one of our best selling dwarfs for a good reason. Everybody loves this one. It's compact, it's dense. It kind of fits that niche, has a bubbly, rounded leaf to it, so it gives it a real nice appearance to it, especially in that fall color. Quintessential ginkgo for a container. Like, if you're going to grow you know, one on a patio, it's hard to beat American. Now, you mentioned that he didn't put Peve in front of American, but he did put it on the variegated sport, Peve Maribo. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, the variegated sport that happened on American, he did put that name on. Again, if you have a Peve Maribo that doesn't show variegation, guess what? You've got American... Uh, but this is a compact, small dwarf that is exceptional. I mean, for me, this is one of the smallest. It has one of the most perfect rounded shapes of any of the ginkgo trees. Uh, you know, I have noticed that some people are doing these on standards. Standards does tend to increase the size and vigor quicker in these dwarf ginkgos. So if you've got one on a high standard, they will grow a little bit quicker than one that's grafted. You know, if one's grafted at five feet, it's going to grow a lot quicker than one that's grafted at a foot or one that's grafted lower, closer towards the base. Yeah, there's one there at UT that's really large, and it was put on like a five-foot standard. It was probably donated by Don Shadow originally, I think. And I do feel like those trees on a standard greatly increase the shape. So if you're going to, if you're going to get American and you want it to be small, I recommend getting a low graft. And I do think part of that, too, is on how thick the caliper is of the tree because if you've got a huge root system and motor behind the plant when you start out you know if you're grafting to a tree that already was a 15 foot tree right and grafting american to that you're going to get a bigger tree quicker but i have seen that done a little more frequently than uh in times past and with the ginkgos it seems to really increase vigor and make those trees a lot bigger a lot quicker Excellent tree, though. Typically four by four, you know, when done properly, even in a 10 year span. Uh, you know, if it's grafted to a skinny high graft, it may not affect it as much as to something that already has a big root system with a big motor behind it. American, excellent tree to be growing, though. Again, three through nine eats up the sun, eats up the cold, eats up the heat, pollution tolerant, disease resistant, salt tolerant. I mean, these are plants people could put next to pools, and they're going to take that reflective surface and do fine. Ginkgos are literally bulletproof. I mean, they are so incredible plants. You can just put these, well, not literally bulletproof. Don't stand behind one and shoot and then sue me. So don't, they're not literally bulletproof. <laughs> they, they feel bulletproof in the garden. It's an out, incredible plant. And uh, for that reason, ginkgos are some of our top selling plants here on Mr. Maple. So guys, that's a little bit behind the scenes here at mrmaple.com for ginkgos in 2023. We've shown you what our top sales plants were in ginkgos. So whether you're in the industry or a collector, we hope you've learned something new about ginkgo trees from this podcast today. These are the ones we sell, and and honestly, these are the ones we sell in big numbers. These are the ones everybody's coming to us asking for. People are signing up to get notified when they're back in stock. If you see something on there that wasn't available that you want, you can always go add your email to it, and we'll email you when we do have it in stock. Sometimes sell out pretty fast. So it's shocking that some of these put up enough numbers to even be on this list because some of these tend to, you know, they tend to be gone as soon as we list them. Now, when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at production and I'm thinking, there's some plants on that we have of ginkgos that we should have produced more that could have made this list. Right, right. Ross Moore, for instance. Rocky and Bullwinkle. Ross Moore is the most <laughs> weeping selection of ginkgo that's out there. And we didn't produce it enough this year in, to make In previous the list. years, it's dominated our list. We have offered it this year, but in smaller numbers. In previous years, it has probably been in the top three. And Rocky and Bullwinkle, like you just mentioned, that is one of the best pairings of ginkgos in the trade. Bullwinkle's got those leaves that look like, you know, a moose's antlers. <laughs> right. And then you've got Bullwinkle. Uh, I mean, you, then you've got Rocky. That is a really small leaf, super dwarf selection. So that's when you have a pair, right? That's so when you've got the, the whole pair. set like that. Like, hey, one, two, I got it. I got the whole team. 
<laughs> that's a that's a series you can complete really quickly unless somebody comes out with like Alvin and the Chipmunks and Bugs Bunny. And then you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta go into the whole animated universe. Great plants, though. We love ginkgos, and I hope you do too. A little bit of different podcast today. We you know we kind of open things up and show you guys behind. If you want to participate, you can either jump in the comment section on our live chat on YouTube on uh, Sunday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern. Let us know your favorite ginkgo we've offered this year, or just your favorite ginkgo in general. If you're not on there, or this is over by the time of that, go over to our Facebook group. It's just Mr. Maple Friends on Facebook. Hop in there. Let us know what your favorite ginkgo is, and we'd love to hear from you. We thank you all so much for listening today. Make sure you're subscribed and give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform. That helps more people find us. And as always, y'all, we'd really appreciate if you remember to shop with us on MrMaple.com. We got a lot of cool stuff happening right now. We got some new merch out. People ask about our hats. We got Maple Mafia hats hitting our merch stores. Uh, Joe and Nigel have new merch coming out for us every single Monday. So be ready at Mondays at 10 a.m. Eastern. Sometimes they have new and interesting hats, t-shirts, things like that hitting the website. Be sure to check that out if you want any of our merch. But again, you know, we appreciate everybody out there. Take care. God bless. And have a great day.